Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of Why Monarchs Matter and How We Can Help. My name is Kathy Bryla, and I am from Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. For those of you who this is your first Sag Moraine presentation, uh, we are an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit in the near west and southwest suburbs of Chicago, although we are forever expanding our territory and, and by partnering with the Illinois Monarch Project, we are expanding our territory through the state of Illinois. Um, we are, please check out our website, sagmoraine.org. Uh, there's a ton of information on there about our organization, what we do, why we do it. But our mission is to encourage the restoration of native plants to our Illinois landscapes to help our pollinators, our birds, and our future generations. So please check out sagmoraine.org and reach out to us, connect with us. We would love to, uh, we'd love to connect with you. We have partnered with the Illinois Monarch Project and the Brookfield Zoo to form what we call our partnership, our pollinator partnership. And this webinar series is called Save a Species, Save Our Future. And we, the three organizations are coming together to try to promote monarch conservation efforts in Illinois. We're trying to combine our efforts in, to unite Illinois communities and amplify conservation efforts of adding 150 million new milkweed stems and other nectar resources to the Illinois landscape by 2038. And we need more and more people in Illinois to get on board to make this happen and save these beautiful creatures from extinction. So thank you for joining us tonight to learn how you can help be part of the solution. Our goals are to raise awareness about monarch butterflies and their conservation needs, encourage understanding and compassion for monarchs, motivate action on behalf of monarch butterflies, and plant native plants, including milkweed, at home or work to help support monarchs. I just want to put a plug in for the next presentation in our series, Save a Species, Save Our Future webinar series. will be on Wednesday, April 24th at 7 p.m., that will be the ins and outs of creating a native pollinator garden. So if after tonight you are completely uh, tempted to start your own pollinator garden to help monarchs and our other pollinators, which I'm sure you will be, um, this will give you a, a lot of information to help make that endeavor easier and clearer. Also, for those of you who are in the Chicago area, we are going to be doing an in-person event at Brookfield Zoo during Pollinator Week. And we will our event will be on June 19th from 10 to 3 at the Nature Stage. And there will be educational opportunities, crafting opportunities for all age groups to learn more about monarchs and our pollinators. And I do also want to put a plug in for those of you who live in the Chicago area. Uh, Sag Moraine will be having our third annual native plant sale on Saturday, June 1st, and there will be a lot of milkweed there. Uh, it will be at Moraine Valley Community College in Palos Hills. And we have a number of plant packages with corresponding designs available for pre-order on our website. So basically, you not only will have the plants, but you'll know how to plant them, how far to space them. And... Um, Check that out on the website if you're in the area. And if you put in the code MONARCH10 at checkout, you will receive 10% off between now and April 10th. Okay, on to our presentation. And I will be joined a little bit later by um, a number of uh, volunteers for the Illinois Monarch Project. Um, I will be joined by Kevin Malinowski, Brian Sullivan, and Natalie Lichtenbert. So they'll be coming on shortly. So don't worry, you don't have to listen to my voice all night. Uh, but back a little bit to, to why we're even 
making this webinar? Why we're we even talking about this? Why, why do we even have the Illinois Monarch Project? If you haven't heard, monarch butterfly populations have decreased by more than 90% in recent decades. Many, many research studies that I read indicate it's probably 96% or greater. And unfortunately, it seems to have taken another steep decline uh, this past year. And it is the, low, the second lowest year of monarch population um, ever recorded. Um, so in this presentation, we're going to discuss why this decline is happening. And it's, but it's not going to be all depressing because uh, we're also going to talk about simple ways we can all help monarchs and other pollinators in our own landscape. Because truly, it's estimated that about 97% of land in Illinois is privately owned. So truly, all landowners in Illinois have the ability to solve this problem and prevent the, the further decline and extinction of the monarch butterfly. So overall, this is a, there might be some depressing slides in this webinar, but overall it's a webinar of hope because we really can make a difference. Let's talk a little bit about this amazing creature, the monarch butterfly. It really truly is a wonder of nature. It is the only butterfly known to make a two-way migration like birds. And the, the the thought of these little guys, these delicate little guys being able to travel 3,000 miles um, in their migration is just, it's just amazing. They winter in the Oamal fir, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, Oamal fir forests in Mexico. The Oamal fir forests north of Mexico City provide the perfect temperatures and humidity for monarchs to overwinter. So they're kind of overwintering in a semi um, uh, hibernating state because um, they, they actually can have a little bit of snow down there. It's not necessarily like if you're thinking tropical, but there's something about the temperature and the humidity that's just perfect for them to overwinter. When the weather begins to warm in March, the monarchs begin their northward migration. Along the way, they will breed and lay eggs. The only, the only plant on which monarchs can lay their eggs and feed their caterpillars is milkweed. So milkweed is gonna be a big, a big part of this uh, discussion tonight because monarchs can't exist without milkweed. As you can see in this map, each generation will continue to fly further and further north. And it will take four generations for monarchs to reach the Northern um, United States and Canada. So they fly a little bit further north, they breed. That those offspring go a little bit further north, generation two, they breed. That generation goes a little bit further north. So by the time they get to Illinois, for the most part, we're talking about gener generation three, and or generation four. Generation four or the super generation in the fall when temperatures begin to cool and the milkweed fades, this super generation of monarchs will make that 3000 mile migration back to their winter grounds in Mexico to start it all over again in the spring. Really amazing. Another amazing thing is monarch navigation skills are second to none. Uh, these amazing creatures can find their way back to the same location, perhaps even the same tree where previous generations have wintered. How do they do that? How do they find their way back to that same tree where their forefathers overwintered the previous season? Just, just amazing. And Illinois landscapes are critical to the future of monarch butterflies. As you can see in this map, they migrate right through the state of Illinois. And the state of Illinois is a long state. So how successful Illinois is at getting pollinator plants and specifically milkweed restored to our landscapes um, is very important in the future survival of the monarchs. 
And I just want to divert a little bit and you talk about like why why does this matter? One creature, if if this one creature goes it's extinct, is it really going to matter? Maybe not in the whole scheme of things if it was just about the monarch. But first of all, think of what an amazing creature it is. And do we really want to lose that? That 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 this you know, with, with its amazing migration and it's just an iconic creature. But the truth is if we don't get some of these native plants, native pollinator plants back into our landscapes, it really isn't just the monarch we're talking about. The monarch is the poster child because it's being, it's, it's noticeable. It has people's attention. It does this amazing <clears throat> migration, but unfortunately this problem is going on throughout our pollinator populations. And that problem is the fact that, I mean, picture it, we we picture what the landscapes in Illinois were a hundred, two hundred years ago. This was the prairie state, and there was, and it was covered by largely our native prairie plants. Those are the plants that all of our native pollinators co-evolved with over hundreds and thousands of years. As we have removed those plants because of agriculture, urban spread, urban sprawl, suburban sprawl, uh, industry, the more, as we have removed all of those prairies, we have um, eliminated the majority of these native plants. And these native plants were, are, uh, just like milkweed is vital to the monarch, Many other species of native plants are vital to the survival of so many of our other native pollinators. Why does that matter so much? Okay, so, so let's say that that all, I mean, our butter, I'll just say it, I'm going to be, you know, negative. Our butterflies and our, our moths are dying out and because their caterpillars don't have the native plants that they need, that they co-evolve with to feed on. Why does this matter? Well, it matters to birds because those very caterpillars are critical. They're a critical food source for baby birds. Even if adult birds feed on seed or berries, 99% of birds need insects to feed their young. And it is the caterpillars of butterflies and moths that are the most nutritious, most essential um, food sources for, for the majority of species of young birds. So as the native plants disappear from their, the landscapes and therefore the caterpillars disappear from our landscapes, so do the birds disappear from our landscapes. Does this matter? It absolutely matters. We, birds are so cheerful and cute and sweet, and it's not really hard to to you know other uh, other unlike bees, it's not really hard to convince somebody to love birds. But we forget how truly essential they are to us. Birds provide some essential ecosystem services that we basically can't survive without. They keep destructive agricultural insects in check. They pollinate many flowering plants. They prevent disease through waste removal. They spread seeds and restore ecosystems. And they help to store carbon and keep the climate stable by sustaining natural landscapes. These guys are the sowers of our natural landscapes. And those natural landscapes are vital to the very air we breathe and water we drink. Pretty concerning when you consider that we have lost three billion birds in the last three decades. And this is largely due to lack of native plants and therefore lack of the caterpillars that they need to breed. We need birds, birds need insects, and guess what? Those insects need native plants. Let's talk about bees a little bit. A little bit harder to get people to like bees, although we at Sag Moraine definitely we try to help people or encourage people and 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 spread more the truth about bees because they've gotten kind of a bad name because of yellow jacket wasps. So I'm not going to go go down that road, but I just want to. But bees are 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 critical. They're critical pollinators to us. We absolutely need them. Their declines are extremely concerning. Um, and many of our native bees 
are what they call specialist bees. About close to 50% are specialist bees, meaning they too need the pollen from certain native plants with which they co-evolved to feed their larva. Without those native plants and the pollen from those native plants, they too can't reproduce. And so what's happening, our native bee population is declining drastically. Some people might say, think it would be a better world without bees um, if, you're, if you don't like them around your garden or around you know, where you sit, but that really is not an option. Bees, are, bees in general are our most efficient pollinators and native bees specifically are truly our most efficient pollinators. And yes, more than 150 food crops in the US depend on pollination, which sounds important and it truly is important, but really even more important is the fact that pollination is the key to the production of oxygen. Pollinated plants sequester carbon. Pollinated plants help to purify water and prevent erosion. And pollinated plants return moisture to the atmosphere of, of helping to control our weather. So as you can see, the, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the we our weather conditions are all affected by pollinated plants and we need those bees to pollinate those plants. Now with more good news, I'm going and an understanding of why this is happening and why these native plants uh, or some of the reasons why these native plants and milkweed in particular have disappeared from our landscapes. I'm going to introduce from the Illinois Monarch Project, Kevin Malinowski, and he's going to share some um, riveting information with you. Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Kathy. I'll try not to bum everybody out too much, but um, I'm Kevin Malinowski. I'm with the Illinois Monarch Project. I'm a partnerships coordinator. Um, and, you know, some of this stuff is not all rainbows and butterflies, but uh, it is important to understand to really know what monarchs and other pollinators are up against and why it's so important that, you know, we all get involved and do our part um, to give them a shot. So uh, you can go ahead and go to the Next slide. So four of the biggest things um, stacking up against pollinators and monarchs are climate change, uh, shifting agricultural practices, urban sprawl, and the loss of native plants. Really one, two, and three there are all having a big impact on number four, um, which is kind of, uh, you know, becoming a bigger and bigger issue for these native pollinators and butterflies. So we're going to start out with climate change. Next slide. So the monarchs rely on temperature change to prompt migration. Um, you know, as you've seen here in Chicago over the last year or two, you know, these big swings in temperature were over, you know, well, I think it was Martin Luther King Day of this year, it was zero or even 10 below. And then Within two to three weeks in February, we got up to, you know, we were in 70, 75 degrees almost for an extended period of time. Um, and then all of a sudden it's regular Chicago March weather and it's cold and gloomy. So as the climate ch changes like that and these more erratic swings, it's it's really difficult for monarchs because um, scientists and the biologists have seen in the last few years that the uh, monarchs are staying at the northern end of their migration for for up to six weeks more than they you know traditionally have and their their fall migration starts late august um anywhere to october so you know if they're hanging out deeper into october and then you know even up almost till november and then they start and they get you know back to illinois and all of a sudden we get this um we get this uh cold snap or a blizzard they are not equipped to handle that. So um, that's one big concern. And it also goes the other way in the spring when they um, start going from um, Mexico uh, back up into the US. If, if they get a prompt um, that, that is due to an erratic weather shift, it's not always, it usually is, is not a good sign. So that in addition to, um, you know, just drought and high temperatures over the summer season, that's, makes it more difficult for milkweed to survive. Uh, so less milkweed 
not good for monarchs. Um, next slide. So I wanted to go into uh, land use changes over the last couple hundred years. Uh, so we'll look at, you know, Illinois, what it looked like, you know, 200 years ago and now. There's been farms here for hundreds of years. What's different? Um, and that includes the transition to an industrialized monoculture, which is basically, um, you know, way bigger farms with one, maybe two uh, crops. In our case, it's soy and corn almost uh Almost totally. And then another thing on that is uh, GMO. You probably hear GMOs all the time. They're on your chip bags and, you know, non-GMO this, non-GMO that. In our case, um, in Illinois and a lot of the Midwest, the GMOs are, uh, it's genetically modified organism. And our corn and soy is modified to uh, withstand the application of an herbicide glyphosate, also known as Roundup. So these crops are known as Roundup ready crops. Um, and, and GMOs have been around and, and for food since the early 80s. Um, you know, they're not all, it's not all bad. There's a lot of good things that have come from GMOs. You know, things like uh, using chili DNA to make uh, a spicy tomato strand or uh, disease resistant bananas. Uh, even uh, there's a apple called the Arctic apple that's engineered to resist browning when you slice it. The idea being nobody likes to eat browned apples and it'll it'll reduce food waste. So in you know a lot of those cases GMOs are great. Um, in our case they're what they're modified for um, is becoming and, and has become a very big problem. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about you know how that's grown over the years and, and the glyphosate resistance. Um, perfect. So Kathy actually touched on this earlier. Um, this is a Predictive native vegetation in Illinois pre-European settlement. So just, you know, that big yellow swath in the middle um, is, was, was native prairie it's lo loaded with, um, uh, you know, flowers and, and native plants. And then even, you know, you got a lot of oak savanna um, and, and native woodland there where there's plenty of stuff for pollinators and monarchs to, uh, to you know, feed on. So... We're gonna to go to the next one, which is current day. And so you can see at the top of this chart here, um, the agricultural land in the state of Illinois is at 27 and a half million acres. And if you look all the way at the bottom, statewide total acreage is 36 million. So the vast majority of our land in Illinois is for agriculture. And then again, at the top under agricultural land, you see corn and soybeans kind of neck and neck for, um, the most use, but you got 20 million acres or more than that under uh, cultivation for those two, almost all of which are Roundup ready and um, a lot being a lot of glyphosate is being applied. <coughs> Brian, can you go on mute? Do you mind muting your microphone? Thank you. Um, what I really wanted to point out and what I think is very important for this, this webinar today is you see the pink and purple, which is development, basically developed land. So you got Chicago up in the top right. Um, you got, you can see Peoria and Champaign, Rockford, there, these little pink and purple specks throughout, um, throughout the state. And traditionally, you know, you think of a city, you're like, well, that's not great habitat for a butterfly or, or you know, birds or really anything, but now, due to the changes in our landscape, and especially in the countryside, those little developed areas have become safe havens and, and really um, absolutely vital for monarchs and other pollinators in order to, um, you know, get the nectar they need, get the milkweed they need, because most of our state in the agricultural areas has basically become a biological desert. Um, so... We can go to the next slide. All right. So, like I mentioned earlier, there's been farms in Illinois for hundreds of years, and you know, there's still most of our land is still under agricultural use. So, so what's changed? Uh, 1940, Illinois had 214,000 farms. In 2022, that number had been reduced to 71,000. Um, Fifty percent of Illinois farmland farmland is rented out by absentee landowners. So, and that kind of goes along with the next bullet there, where um, 
a REIT or real estate investment trust is basically a stock you can buy on the New York Stock Exchange where, um, and it's traditionally a pretty good investment from what I read. It, it kind of hedges against inflation and um, there's a lot of pros to making an investment in that. But what's happening is these companies are, they do what they call a sale lease back where they'll buy a farmer's land They'll give a bunch of capital for tractors and uh, pesticides and fertilizer. And then that farmer no longer owns their land. They pay rent to the company. Um, and so they have to be as efficient as possible. And they're, they're basically, you know, trying to make the most money, um, which reduces stewardship responsibilities to a degree. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then just wanted to know that 44% of our grain that we grow corn and soy here in the state of Illinois is exported. So we, you know, we put the, the chemicals and the fertilizer and, and the herbicide on our land. We use our water, um, and then we ship it out of, not even just out of state, but out of the, out of the country. So, um, we'll get into a little more detail here. You can go to the next slide, please. All right. So I don't want to bore you guys too much with a stats lecture, but this is a, a an interesting chart and you can kind of see the decline um, of the number of farms. If you just focus on the right side of this, you'll see the top, the year 1956, there were 175,000 farms, 31,200 times a thousand acres under cultivation, and then average farm size was 178 acres. And then this only goes to 1999, but if you go down to the bottom, about 40 years, we lose about 100,000 farms. The, the land and farms goes down a little, but for the most part, it stays static. And then, you know, that, that average size of the farm, still pretty low. It's, it, you, you'd think that's a pretty small family, a lot of family farms out there, which they're still up. But um, go ahead to the next slide. And so this one really describes and, and I'm just trying to build up to show you the trend of, of what's happening here. So this first top line where it says $1,000 to $9,999 of annual revenue. So that's what they call a hobby farm. This could be anything from, you know, you're driving through the country and you see a little farm stand on the side of the road where you can pull over and get some eggs or some produce. And there might be an honesty box or donation box where you can leave a few bucks or, you know, uh, they, they trust you to do that or you could have a little greenhouse in your backyard and, and sell microgreens or you know mushrooms at, at the local farmers market on a Saturday um, as, as as a hobby. So you, you can see here, and and this is a lot of the Midwest, but we'll focus on Illinois. So the number of these hobby farms in Illinois is twenty seven thousand five hundred, with a total acreage of one point two million and an average acreage of forty four acres. So. You look down then at the bottom and there's some stuff in between here oil I'll, I'll touch on but so this is basically the smallest farms and then the compared to the largest so anything over a million dollars in annual revenue there's only only 4400 but where the devil's in the details then you look over and you see the total acreage and it's 10.7 million acres compared to the 1.2 and um average acreage uh 2500 so farms keep getting bigger. They're making they're they're more built to make money. Um, and but if you go on Google and you say what's the average farm size in Illinois? Oh, I think as of last year it was 370 acres. You're like, oh, that's pretty small. But seeing this, it kind of shows that that's not really you know that's not really the trend that is, is happening. It's it's a lot of these smaller hobby farms. And in between this, there's mid sized and smaller farms that make up the difference. But thought that was an interesting. Uh, interesting graph there so you can you can move on next slide so with these larger farms um comes a number of challenges to to environmental stewardship like i said before a lot of the land is no longer owned by the farmer um the fields are, are getting significantly bigger um you know, back in the day, a farmer may be known to to walk their fields and look for specific instances of a, a certain pest or certain weed. And then it's called integrated pest management, where they treat that area for that specific thing. Anymore, when you've got 
4,000 acres of the same thing. And those plants are built and modified to withstand very powerful, affordable, for the most part, herbicide and glyphosate. You're just going to spray your whole field. And one of the reasons, another reason they do that is they've only got one shot to get a paycheck at, at, after the harvest. If, if they risk it and a weed comes in or some kind of pest comes in and their their crop goes you know goes south and they don't have anything to sell at the end of the, the harvest, um, they're just out of luck um, in, in a lot of cases. And so there's kind of an insurance policy for them to just cover everything and spray everything um, in order to make sure that they're, they're getting their harvest at the end of the year. Um, so we can go ahead and next slide. And so this is a chart from 1992. Um, you can see down, you can actually, yeah, bottom left there, um, a good chunk of Illinois was using about five to 25 pounds per square mile of glyphosate at that point. And then even a lot of it was less than, um, less than five pounds per square mile. And just to reiterate, this glyphosate is basically any milkweed it touches, it's going to, it's going to kill it. And not to mention a bunch of other native, anything other than the uh, modified corn and soy doesn't stand much of a chance. Um, and so let's fast forward to 2019. And you can't even really see the state of Illinois boundaries anymore, or a lot of the Midwest. And if you look down in the bottom there, now we've gone up to uh, greater than 115 pounds per square mile of this glyphosate Roundup um, that we're spreading all over the state. And then obviously way up into the northern Midwest and and all over the country. And so what that is doing is it's it's producing glyphosate resistance. Um, I mean, it's pretty amazing that in 30 years, a lot of the weeds are starting to adapt to it and um, they're, they're becoming more and more, um, uh, they, they don't, it's not harmed as much. So we keep putting more and more on and, you know, it just, it, it's not good for the water. It's, there's human impacts that are being debated and that's a whole nother webinar that we won't go into today, but, um, Overall, not a good chance for, for monarchs and other pollinators when there's this much herbicide being spread uh, on such a wide scale. Next slide. Last thing I'll say on this, just another, this is a uh, US totals from 1990 to 2014. And you can kind of see that exponential growth. Um, if you look down at the bottom under the total crops line in 1990, about seven and a half million pounds were uh, were spread, and then fast forward to 2014, we're over two, we're about 250 million pounds. And I, I just looked, I, I found some for data in 2016, and we we're at 280 million pounds. So it's just exponentially growing, and it just is very concerning um, for you know the amount of milkweed that is out there. So we can go to the next slide. Few other things I'll touch on. I mean, really just to reiterate the gauntlet of issues and uh, things that the monarchs and, and other pollinators are up against. The US EPA regulates 500 different pesticides. Um, the neon neonicotinoids um, are basically kind of what it sounds like. It's a nicotine based uh, pesticide. And th those are really bad for bees. Um, actually, uh, most of or a lot of them have been banned. I'm not even gonna take a stab at some of these other names, but those are more brand names of that type of pesticide uh, that have been banned in the European Union because of their devastating impact on, on bees and pollinators in general. Um, and they do affect, they've been, there's studies that have shown that they affect the uh, monarch caterpillars and larval, and they basically have a variety of negative impacts on the, the health and wellness of, of the caterpillars. And then even when they become an adult, it, it makes makes them less healthy basically um pyrethroids are when you see the mosquito truck cruising around with a big cloud of fog and they say oh it's fine it's not going to hurt anything but the mosquitoes it's devastating to adult monarchs all kinds of other moths and um you know nocturnal pollinators especially that are out and about when they're spraying um 
And then Paraquat's been around forever, very powerful pesticide. Again, what I'm trying to say is the odds are stacked against these butterflies and, and other insects. Um, so that's why we got to do our part. And I'm almost done here. We're going to get to the more positive stuff soon. And then just uh, last thing I'll say, you know, around your house, if you don't want to spray toxic stuff, which I recommend, uh, there's all kinds of resources online, but you can, you can use household chemicals or, you know, for, or just for a lot of things like uh, vinegar, ammonia soap, you can use different salt solutions for herbicide or even citric acid does the trick sometimes. And then for pesticides, again, um, different mixtures of, of salt sprays, uh, neem oil, which you can buy on Amazon for, for pretty cheap. And then I did want to mention, do not use a bug zapper. Um, they indiscriminately kill everything. Um, you know, might get a few mosquitoes, but, you know, tons of moths and, and nocturnal beetles and all kinds of important insects and pollinators um, just get, get zapped by those. So get some citronella candles or maybe invest in a screened in porch, but I wanted to make sure to reiterate that one. And uh, I think that's it, right? For me, Catherine, there we go. Back to you. Yes, yes it is. And, and I'm sorry you had to share so much bad, distressing news. I feel like we're all contaminated here now in Illinois after seeing all those <laughs> chemicals that are just surrounding us. But but we needed to see that to show what we're up against. And, um, and really, uh, it, it's, it's up to us to, to make a difference where we live because, uh, the country that we used to count on is not there anymore. What we have is contaminated, uh, corporate farms, exactly GMO soybeans and corn and lots of pesticides a lot yeah <laughs> well cheers up but we can help if you own or you have influence over any land you can be part of the solution and that's what we want to focus on here we can all help we can all help save the monarch prevent it from going extinct and save and help all of our native pollinators and how do we do that well, the first thing we're going to do is we have to plant Illinois native milkweed for monarch caterpillars. Again, milkweed is the only plant that their caterpillars can feed on. So it's the only plant that the adult monarchs will lay their eggs. The good news is, is there are many species of Illinois native milkweed, and they, they um, have different site needs based on, you know, how much sun they need, how much water they need. So there is pretty much a milkweed out there for whatever site conditions you have. And we're going to go over um, the main native milkweed species of Illinois. First one is butterfly weed. Uh, this is a gorgeous na uh, native milkweed, short, mounded orange flowers. This is so attractive and so mounded. It's it's appropriate for anywhere in your landscape, even in your front lawn, front yard or wherever. It's just it's just a lovely plant. Likes medium to dry soil in full sun. So if you have a hot, sunny, dry place, plant this milkweed. Then we have common milkweed. Uh this likes dry to medium soil in full to part sun. It is, um, it's a taller milkweed, it gets to be about six feet tall, larger, more leathery leaves. Uh, this milkweed can be a little bit aggressive. It's great in the prairies or in natural lands and, and restored areas, but um, may not be your best choice if you are in a small yard. There are other species that, um, are less robust. I'm just going to say the word robust. One of these would be prairie milkweed. Um, it likes medium moisture soil and it likes full sun. It is similar to common milkweed, but less aggressive. And if you want to write down any of these names, feel free to take screenshots. If you want to look up more of these, um, or you can always rewatch the webinar and, and 
pause on certain slides during um, on YouTube. Poke milkweed. Uh, this is uh, more of a white milkweed and uh, or like a very light pink white milkweed. This this is a good one for um, wetter conditions, but it also likes dry. So how how you know how can you be easier to grow than that? Medium wet to medium dry soil. It's pretty adaptable. Cool thing about this poke milkweed is it's a milkweed that grows well in shade to part shade. Most milkweeds like sun to part sun, but if you have a shady area under some trees and a lot of a lot of tree canopy in your yard, then you can go with the poke milkweed to help our monarchs. Purple milkweed. Uh, this is kind of an endangered species of milkweed. Um, it does like sandier soil. So if you have sandier, so I, I am successfully growing some in a raised bed that is less heavy clay than most of our soil is here in Illinois. And it's it, very successful. It, it's probably the prettiest flowers of all milkweeds, um, but it does like a sandier soil. And it was normally found more, more in sandy places along shorelines and so on. But this, there's so little of this left in um, in Illinois. Showy milkweed. This is a very pretty milkweed. Uh, likes dry to medium soil. Again, full sun. This is another one that gets to be kind of tall, about six feet tall, but it doesn't spread as rigorously by underground runners. So it's much less um, robust than the common milkweed. My personal favorite is swamp milkweed. It does like moist to wet soil and full to part sun. But um, I mean, you can easily grow it in average garden soil. It really don't, don't don't be thrown off by the name swamp. It may not do well in the hardest of droughts, but it really is very adaptable in any normal garden conditions. And I love this milkweed. It smells like vanilla. It ha it's a lovely plant. And whenever I find monarch caterpillars in my yard, it's always on the swamp milkweed. Green milkweed. Uh, this likes dry to moist soil. Again, very adaptable, dry to moist, full sun to full shade. So pretty adaptable. Now I want to talk about a type of milkweed that you don't want to plant. So a lot of times people will plant um, in pots. If you, let's say you don't have a garden, you have a, a patio with some containers a lot of people say, well, I want to help the monarch, so I'm going to plant this tropical annual milkweed. Um, but I want to say, and I know that this is not going to be a popular statement with a lot of people, and there's people who whine and don't want to talk to me after I tell them this and the whole thing. And um, But it truly is hurting monarchs more than it's helping them. Uh, it doesn't die back as early as our native milkweed and can house a large amount of, I'm not gonna say that, I'm just gonna say OE for short. If you wanna say that name uh, 10 times fast, go right ahead. Um, but what OE is, is a parasite of monarch butterflies which can decrease their fertility, decrease their lifespan and decrease their chances of a successful migration. Native milkweeds, after they bloom and the seed pod forms and the seed pod opens and those beautiful white feathery seeds blow, those milkweeds die back after flowering. And the OE levels don't have the chance to build up as high. There might be some present, but they don't build up as high. Whereas the non-native tropical milkweed keeps blooming longer into the season with more and more monarchs and, and other insects visiting the plant. And so these OE levels become higher and can, can affect the monarchs that visit the plant. Also, because it's blooming longer, the, the monarchs, other than the sun and the, 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 the length of day, they're gauging when to start migrating on their, their you know, super 3000 migration south to, to Mexico. 
one of the things that tells them when it's time to go is when the milkweed is dying out, when there's no longer fresh leaves to for their caterpillars to eat, they know that it's time to leave. But because this milkweed is blooms longer and the foliage stays uh, green and fresh longer, it can confuse monarchs and cause them to keep breeding when they should be migrating. And then you have um, more that are being getting trapped and not able to make it south during the warmer, the warmer temperatures. Now, when you plant milkweed, you are going to attract some other insects to milkweed. Milkweed is a popular plant of all um, pollinators. You know, bees do do like it too, and other butterflies and moths like it too. So it's going to be a popular garden plant to. Uh, more than the monarchs, uh, which is good. We want to help. We want to help them all. And you're going to see some bugs that might freak you out, but but don't freak out. These are not bad bugs. Okay. So one thing that you will see on there are these milkweed bugs, and they might look a little shocking at first. You you see the the adult in the center and the little the little nymphs to the side. They might look shocking. They do not harm the monarchs. They don't harm the monarch caterpillars or the monarch eggs. What they're doing is they are sucking the juices out of the seed pod, which helps to dry the seed pod, which helps the seed pod to open and the seeds to disperse. So they're actually helping the monarchs by helping the milkweed disperse and, and grow new, monarch, new milkweed plants. These are another story. These are going. To, these are an annoyance of growing milkweed. And if anybody has a non, you know, a, a very safe way to control these, I would love to hear it. Um, these are a an a non-native invasive aphid, and they love they love milkweed. They don't directly harm the monarch eggs or caterpillars. But they can draw other, um, like, for example, ants will come to the plant in, in search of, of these. And they will also, you know, find then the monarch eggs and caterpillars. So they can attract other critters that will be, uh, that, can, that can harm the monarchs. So they don't directly do it, but indirectly they can. That being said, there's not really any way you can get rid of them without also harming the monarch eggs and caterpillars. Any kind of chemicals obviously is, is a no-go. Um, even like, yes, you know, a, a solution of, you know, water and dish soap can be used and that can be very effective on these, but it's also going to harm the, the monarchs, you know, so it's just, it, it's not, you know, obviously as horrible as, as a bunch of chemicals, but it still can do damage. It's still going to do damage to the monarchs. The one thing that we always say that you can do is hard hose your milkweed. And that will not, I mean, you cannot, you can go and you can take these off with wet rags and, and, and get rid of them, pick them off. But if you don't necessarily want to go down that route, um, you can hard hose them and get most of them off, which will help control the population. Um, but if there's any monarch caterpillars or eggs on the milkweed, you could also hose them off. So basically what I'm saying now is if it's early in the season and you haven't seen any monarchs yet and they haven't... Um, uh, and you you have reason to believe that they're not in your yard yet and they haven't laid any eggs on your milkweed yet, during that time of the season, maybe hard hose your milkweed to get these off to prevent um, a huge population um, from growing. But then as soon as you start seeing the monarchs utilize uh, your yard and your, your, your milkweed, then I would just let nature take its course and let them be. That's what I'm recommending now. Now, once that's, that's the milkweed and that's for the caterpillars to feed on. But the adult monarchs also need good nectar plants for their... Um, to, for, to breed, to find a mate and breed, to, um, if they're the fourth generation, to migrate 
So um, we need to plant an abundance of good nectar plants for the adult feeding monarchs. This is also vital to, um, you know, to help save them. So I'm going to go over a few of the native plants that are most favored by monarch butterflies. I also want to encourage you, and we have the link in the chat to the Sag Moraine native plant selector. And there's a ton more plants in there that are loved by monarchs and other pollinators. So, so take a look through the native plant selector. What we did is we took, we, we looked through native plants and we didn't, we didn't include all native plants in our selector. We included native plants that are good for smaller suburban or urban settings or smaller yards. Um, if you, if you have, you know, there's, there's more plants if you have larger spaces and you own acres, then there's more plants that are available that can be beautiful in larger areas. But our native plant selector is geared more towards your average homeowner's yard size. But some of the favorites of monarchs, and you're going to see a little bit of a similarity here for the most part on the colors that attract monarch butterflies and butterflies in general. One is wild bergamot. Um, this is a lovely plant in the mint family, and it grows two to five feet tall, likes full to part sun, dry to moist soil, and um, blooms June, July, and August. And when this is in bloom, everybody in the garden is, is visiting this. Next one is Hori Vervain. Uh, so this is our native um, verbena. And it gets two to five feet tall, likes full sun, dry to medium soil. And this blooms July, August, and September. Ironweed. Uh, this is a taller one. So this would be good for the back border of your garden. And this grows four to six feet tall, full to part sun, likes moist, the, so the soil to be on the moister side. So put, put this in a place that has, um, you know, good moisture. I have it planted on one side of my garage that gets a lot of rain runoff from the garage roof. Blooms July, August, September. Anise hyssop. Uh, this is one of my favorite garden uh, native plants for the garden because everybody loves it and it blooms forever. It has such a long bloom season and the bees, the butterflies, the... Um, the hummingbirds and they just love it. And then when the seed head cuts come, the goldfinches are all over it. So it's just a great native garden plant. Um, it is an herb and uh, you can use it in your teas. If you rub the, the leaves, it's going to smell kind of like licorice. It's two to four feet tall, full to part sun, medium to dry soil. And this again has a very long bloom season, July, August, September. New England aster. Very important plant for our migrating monarchs. Uh, grows three to six feet tall, full to part sun, medium to moist soil. And because this is blooming in the fall, August, September, October, this is one of those critical plants that they're, they're depending on to fuel their way south. So here's another little, a little exception. This is a yellow one that they love. So this is Axi sunflower. It also grows three to six feet tall, dry to moist soil, full sun. And this blooms in June, July, and August and September. Long bloom season here. I don't know what happened there. Let's try that again. Okay, Prairie Blazing Star. When this is blooming, it is... It is just spectacular. It's, it puts on such a show in the native garden. It gets three to five feet tall, full sun, medium to moist soil, blooms July and August. And, the, and I can attest to the fact that the monarchs and the butterflies are all over this when it's blooming. Purple coneflower. They love purple coneflower. Butterflies in general love purple coneflower. And I love purple coneflower because it's beautiful and easy. Uh, grows three to four feet tall, full of part sun, medium to dry soil, and blooms July, August, September. 
Showy goldenrod is another one of those very important late season plants that um, is critical to monarch migration. Uh, it grows one to three feet tall, prefers full sun. I have seen it growing in part sun. I per personally have it growing well in part part sun, so it, it can it can do it. Uh, medium to dry soil and blooms August, September. And mine grows, mine actually some years is blooming into October. Smooth aster. This is a, a lovely aster. A non, if, if you've, some asters can be a little bit robust in the garden, uh, meaning they kind of want to seed themselves and move all over the place. This is a, a much more, um, this one is much more contained and, and does not have the the um, the tendency to take over. It's, it's a beautiful uh, aster. Two to four feet tall, full sun, medium to dry soil, and blooms August, September, and October. Again, critical for those migrating monarchs. Sweet Joe Pie. Four to six feet tall. Here's one for the shade. This likes part shade to shade. Medium soil blooms August and September. Now, let's say that you do have, um, let's say you don't have a yard, but maybe you have a patio or a deck. You can do a lot for the monarchs in your containers as well. Don't do the tropical milkweed, but here are some great annuals to help our monarchs. Um, they love these for nectar, for fuel, and these are some of their favorites. Number one, I'm going to say is zinnias. When, whenever the monarchs are in my yard, they're 90% of the time either on the milkweed or the zinnias. They love, love, love the nectar from zinnias. Lantana is another one of their favorites. Annual sunflowers, they love. Plant some annual sunflowers in a big container. Or cosmos. So these are these are the annual plants that you can grow anywhere in any container. So truly, anybody listening to this can be part of the solution. And we all leave here tonight with the resolves that we are going with the resolve that we are going to save these monarchs. Now I am going to turn the stage over to none other than Brian Sullivan from the Illinois Monarch Project, and he's going to share some other. Um, good things being done at the municipal level. Brian, take it away. Where's Brian? I'm doing my best. <laughs> we hear him. We there don't we see him yet. There, there we, we go. go. There we go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being and sharing part of your evening with us. And we're really excited that Kathy did a phenomenal job laying out our, our A to Z, right? All the who, what, where, when, and why about our monarchs. And Kevin did a splendid job about just setting aside for you the alarm, set really loud and clear about the crisis that we're facing. And here, what can we do? Actions being taken on the local municipal levels. As everyone knows, the old saying is that all politics are local, and it doesn't matter what happens a lot at the federal or state levels, because without perseverance, without paying attention, without a lot of individuals investing their time and energy, all of those efforts can just be set aside. For example, 2017, Bruce Rauner, then governor, signed House Bill 685 that barred counties, municipalities from classifying milkweeds as noxious or exotic weeds or barring, barring their cultivation. We know that there's still today a number of communities that have in their ordinances that milkweed is a noxious weed. We need to be able to educate our next set of legislators on local levels, school boards, park districts, library boards, townships all across the state here of Illinois and all across the country about the importance of being able to plant and harvest and be able to propagate the milkweed, as you just heard a wonderful presentation from Kathy. We want to create monarch-friendly habitats and educate our citizens. Reseeding with native plants and flowers where we can. We want to plant milkweeds in community gardens. 
work with village and park district staff to promote natural pollinator and friendly open spaces. You'd be surprised that once you have a lot of beauty in their, those open spaces and you have butterflies, people will come to them. And you know what happens? They like coming to them and they want to do something on their own. Talk to your friends and promote garden tours. There's a number of your neighbors you know have beautiful gardens. You don't need a whole organization or a whole group or a club to be able to do it. Get your neighbor and say, let's go walk down over on Ashland Street. I know there's three or four gardens over there. And trust me, if you strike up a conversation with the people in that house, they will love to talk to you about their garden. Next slide, please. And how can you help? There's a lot of different ways as we're showing you right here. Join an environmental group. Don't use herbicides as you heard both Kathy and Kevin talking about. Plant your next your own flower garden and what you're doing. We can get municipalities to remove milkweed from the list of noxious plants in their ordinances. Change their weed or mowing ordinance to allow for native prairie plants and habitats. Increase the percentage of native plants and shrubs and trees that must be used in city landscaping or ordinances and encourage use of milkweed where appropriate. Direct city and property managers for HOAs to consider the use of native milkweed and nectar plants in the city properties where appropriate and inside HOAs and to remove restrictive covenants if you live in a homeowners association that say you can't have them. You can't have the milkweed. And we wanna integrate monarch butterfly conservation into the city's and parks master plan, their sustainability plans, the climate and resili resiliency plans and other city plans. The more we incorporate it, the more people see it, the more important it is, and the more likely it is we will follow it, we will protect it, and we will preserve it. Finally, what I would like to tell you is that back in 20, again, 2017 in August, the Illinois State Legislature adopted the milkweed as the official state wildflower. And yet we still have different communities who don't want it. They don't like to see it. And we have to educate them, involve them, go to their board meetings and say, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is the right thing to do. We are the solution and we know what to do. Let's now do it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, my next slide. Role of municipalities and cities, councils, and homeowners associations. As we, we've mentioned some of it already, but the most important thing is the second one. The communities also often have tall grass or weed nurses, and we have to get them all, all to accept the fact that beauty is not just a pristine lawn looking, but a wonderful pollinator garden and it, in all seasons it plays an important role and that when you see those it is a wonderful thing and when it comes down to municipalities everything makes sense and that's with the C. because where we have incorporated monarch friendly areas pollinator gardens and those and we've taken them out of just having to just strictly mow and cut them what we have found is we increase usage of those areas. We reduce stress for the people that are around them. And we save money on pesticides. We save money on fertilizer. We save money on staffing and, and equipment for having to mow all of those properties. It makes sense. Next slide, please. Examples of local action, please read through these as you have time. And you probably have a hundred different ways that you can think of that you've noticed local municipalities being able to step up. Art contests at libraries, school districts who promoted a butterfly release and talk about the migrations of our monarch butterflies. 
planning of different gardens at the local school districts with the PTO and PTAs. What we can do is what we should be concentrating on because there is always something we can do. No matter if someone says you cannot or put this aside, we can always act positively to impact our environment and make it a better place. Uh, my mayor, um, Dominic DiMaggio, um, had a wonderful, wonderful quote for it that I just want to leave you with that says, as stewards of this land, we are committed to the vision of a community conceived, designed, and built to preserve Mother Nature's balance. Our goal is an integrated and sustainable community which honors its heritage, culture, and natural habitats while providing a place that will endure. How pretty, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about. When we talk about our homes, when we talk about our neighborhoods, when we talk about our communities, our state, and our country, we can make the difference. We are the solution. Next slide, please. Okay, what is a pollinator waste station? The future we save is our own. We create a pollinator waste station. It includes two types of milkweed. You plant in full sunlight for milkweed to thrive. You use a minimum of 10 plants to create and start the waste station. And the waste station is exactly what we're talking about. It's a place to stop just like we were driving and you pull off at a way station someplace and you want to see the biggest ball of yarn, they all want to stop here at this way station because it's got beautiful plants. It's got beautiful milkweed that they can thrive on and reproduce. So what we want to talk about is following a sustainable gardening practice and making those way stations prevalent throughout our community. Next slide, please. Okay, Kath, do you want to step in? And so what did IMP and the SAG Marine accomplish in 2023? Well, I just I just want to talk about, I want to go back to something you said. You've motivated me, you've motivated, uh, motivated me, Brian. But I just wanted to say, and, and going back to like your way station and the 10 plants, we're not asking everybody, believe me, we're not asking you to remove your entire lawn and, um, Put a, put a prairie on your whole property. I mean, we realize that a lot of people don't have the, the, the interest, the time, the finances to be able to do big, big plantings like that. But one pot, one container, or one 10 plant garden can be the difference in whether that monarch makes finds a place to lay its eggs makes it on its migratory path, finds a place to refuel. So whatever, even small things help. So we just want to, you know, drive that that point home. We're not asking for the moon. Now, if you're willing to give the moon, all good, but we're not asking for the moon. Um, so what is... Uh, what have we accomplished this year in 2023? Well, we're doing milkweed seed giveaways and we're doing the in-person presentation at the zoo, um, public communication through village newsletters, attending community garden group events, uh, talks at different events. Uh, we have the upcoming uh, presentation during pollinator week at the zoo. That's going to be a great day with a lot of activities going on. And, um, and then I just, I want to put a plug in again for our next webinar. Now that everybody's motivated to put in this pollinator garden with some milkweed, uh, we're going to talk in the next webinar about more specifics on how to do that. Let's see, what do we got? What new projects can you think of? And then, so again, we want everybody in the state of Illinois to take part of this. This is all a volunteer effort to try to say, hey, we own the land, we we have control, we can we can make a difference. 
So if there's any new projects or things that you can think of that you would like this initiative of the Illinois Monarch, the state initiative of the Illinois Monarch Project or the, the partnerships that are the, the, the partnerships for pollinators, if there are other things that you can think of that, that we can do or that, um, that should be done to try to you know, make this happen and save the monarchs and other pollinators, please you know, send us your ideas. Um, all of our, all of the websites are, the links are in the chat. So please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. And I want to say thank you for what, for, for watching this presentation and, you know, thank you, Brian and Kevin. This was, I mean, it was, it was just amazing. I'm, I don't know about anybody else. I'm pumped up and we are going to take some time to answer any questions that you have. But before we do this, I want to do that. I want to turn uh turn the camera over to Natalie Lichtenberg. She is another um, amazing volunteer for the Illinois Monarch Project. And she's going to talk a little bit more about what exactly the Illinois Monarch Project is, how it began, how it started, what it's doing now, visions for the future, and so on. So Natalie, welcome. <laughs> sure. Can... Yes. So yeah, next slide. How's everybody doing today? So yeah, I've been with Illinois Monarch Project since at least 2018. So I kind of know the history behind it and where we came from. Um, it was a very small thing in 2018, but we took a really big step in September of 2020. During the height of the pandemic, it was one of the greatest moments actually in my environmental career where the Illinois Monarch Project actually signed their action plan in a huge ceremony involving many important people in the Illinois area, which really put forth our action plan to do our 150 million uh, milkweed stems. Um, over the past couple of years, since then, we've added several volunteers, really awesome people building this organization. And we have implemented the Wings of Dreams um, bio blitz which is during the pollinator week and this year starting in 2023 and moving to march of 2024 we have um gotten together with sag moraine to create this series of webinars this spring and we'll have also the culmination in pollinator week where we'll have an event at the brookfield zoo uh, as was previously mentioned on juneteenth where we're going in 2024 and beyond is obviously to create more partnerships, get more people involved, get as many people as we can involved. So that brings us to my next slide that we are looking for more volunteers. I am on specifically the Community Engagement Committee. So the committee um, that I am on is our one-stop shop for modern conservation resources to support stakeholders engagement across all sectors and communities in Illinois. This is from the Illinois Department of Transportation to agriculture, rights of way, so on and so forth. So it's from children's new learning experience to the savviest of monarch enthusiast groups. Next slide. So where we've come from, we have the five part virtual summit series in 2020 to 2021, the transition to implementation phase of the Illinois Monarch Project Action Plan, new leadership team and structure for the CEC committee, implementation of our statewide Wings of Dreams BioBlitz, and like I mentioned, the partnership with Sag Marine Native Plant Community. Next slide, please. So we are looking for volunteers. We want you to come fly with us. Next slide, please. We are looking, oh, this is first our organizational charts. Uh, we have very many uh, chairs already filled, such as the partnership chair, our communications chair. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. We're looking for three specific positions right now. We are looking for a website coordinator designer. We are doing a lot of implementation, a lot of new events. So we need uh, somebody that might be available to do website updates, um, you know, quickly and easily. We're looking for an ambassador coordinator. So to explain our ambassadors would be manning our booths at potential fests and community events in the entire Illinois area. We are right now getting a ton of uh, requests for us to have an Illinois Monarch Project table at you know sustainability fest and more. 
Uh, so we need people to man those tables, which of course we would um, train you. We would give you um, the resources and things you need to tell people a little bit more about the Illinois Mono Project. So the ambassador coordinator would actually keep track of their ambassadors and keep track of the events and scheduling. So pretty easy. Um, next slide, please. So the next, uh, the initial task for the website coordinator would be to go through the IMP training session, attend meetings as scheduled, implement annual plan activities, work under our communications chair, and then of course, teamwork with graphic design department, most especially to keep the website updated in live mode throughout the year. Next slide, please. Task for the ambassador coordinator, go through IMP training sessions, attend meetings, implement annual plan activities, work under the director, Andre Copeland, and deputy director, myself, keep track of local events annually, determining resources needed and staffing, and then of course, overseeing the ambassadors, including scheduling and making sure they have all the tools that they need. Next slide, please. The application process is very simple. It's on our IllinoisMonarchProject.org website. We are taking applications as we speak, uh, we would conduct and we would schedule and conduct an interview. And please, uh, I've noticed over the past couple of years with applicants, please be sure to add what position you are applying for and also add a CV or resume. It helps us to know your background ahead of time before we actually meet with you for the interview. And then we, of course, we look forward to working with you soon. Next slide, please. So how to apply, you just wanna to go to the Illinois Monarch Project website and select the Get Involved tab. So you'll see a full listing of the positions, but like I mentioned, we're looking most exclusively for those three positions I just mentioned. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact, uh, contact Andre Copeland or myself. And the email address is right there if you wanna take a screenshot or a picture of that. And that's really all I have. Thank you very much, Natalie. That was wonderful. Please, everybody, come on, join us. It's up to us. We got to look at these cute little guys on the on the leaf over there. Look at them. We got to save them. We need help. Reach out to us. Come on. We'll we'll uh, we're going to do big things together. We're going to save a species. And now, if if you everybody would come back on, Natalie, Brian, Kevin, uh, we'll take questions. Uh, we got a bunch of questions lining up here. So looking forward to seeing what you all have to say. Okay, Debbie says, I rub my my finger on the aphid and smoosh them. Gross but gratifying when they are in a large clump <laughs> and you smoosh a bunch of them with those aphids. Is it, it's probably good stress relief. There's probably something <laughs> therapeutic about going in the garden smooshing yellow aphids. Take out all your aggression on the aphids. <laughs> like bubble wrap. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gross. <laughs> Do monarchs prefer a certain color? Are they drawn to certain colors, types of milkweed flowers? They're, they're drawn to all milkweed flowers. All milkweed flowers really have a, a very similar um, structure. So they're drawn to all of them. But... They, uh, butterflies in general are very drawn to purple and purple pinks that that is those are the and yellow but mostly purple and purple pink so when I was going through the plants you'll notice that the majority of them were, were purple or purpley pink um what part of the milkweed blossom flowers do monarchs feed on well it's all it's made it's like one clump rounded flower made up of all individual little flowers if I don't want to like go back but if you look close at it you'll see one one mounded large flower but that's actually they're all a bunch of little tubular flowers and they stick their proboscis in those little tubular flowers and pull out the nectar well and and the caterpillars eat the leaves and the caterpillars eat the leaves right good good point yes Any thoughts about rearing? I knew somebody was going to ask this. Okay. <laughs> Any thoughts about rearing the caterpillars in outside enclosure, then releasing the butterfly? Um, 
so I'm not going to say it's bad because, you know, I have, I have done it myself. I, I raise a few monarchs every year. I usually get out there and just like 2025, 20, because I do see so many of them being laid on my milkweed and being taken by ants or wasps. And I know that's the natural cycle of things. And in an ideal world where we had plenty of monarchs and plenty of milkweed, there would be enough to go around for everybody. And there'd be enough um, monarch eggs for the wasps to eat and still plenty left for um, uh, to become an adult monarch. But um, we don't live in an ideal world and we live in a world where we have a, a, a creature that's on the verge of extinction. So I do try to help them along and raise some um, inside. I take cuttings off of the milkweed, put it in a vase. You can also take fresh leaves. But, and, and, it, and so I know that it's milkweed from my garden. Those, those have those eggs and caterpillars have only ever been on milkweed that has never touched a chemical. Um, they have plenty of fresh leaves to eat at any time in an area with plenty of humidity. And um, so I personally don't have a problem with doing it. Um, but where I do have a problem is not doing it well. I mean, because, you know, you, anybody who's ever done it, those those caterpillars as they get bigger, I mean they they move their bowels a lot if they have bowels, whatever they have. I don't know the inner makings, but there's a lot of cleanup. I mean you got to get in there and clean up and and change those paper towels every day. So you got to keep it clean. You got to keep the leaves fresh. You got to make sure that it's that it's good milkweed that you've grown and you know it's not tainted and um and. You know, so I, I'm not a fan at all of mail order cocoons. Um, you don't know where those came from. You don't know what, and, and, and so are traveling, somebody making a bunch of money on them, traveling through, through the mail, um, gosh knows what kind of milkweed they were grown on. So what really are you bringing into your garden? So, um, so that's how I feel about that. Anybody else have a comment about that or a feeling about that? Uh, I just heard that they're, you know, slightly genetically different because they've been segregated from the regular population and stuff like that. Right. So yeah, right. I, think I think that's think good to add to the normal population. Right. It's, it, it's a tough question. It's a tough question because it does break your heart when you, when you see a monarch lay a bunch of eggs on your milkweed and you go out there a day later and they've all been eaten. I know. It, well, it, I do take in some of the eggs, but I just wouldn't do the mail order ones. Oh yeah. The mail order yeah. ones. Yes. That's Please what stay away from those. Yeah. Yes. Are butterfly boxes houses good to help protect butterflies? To, to be honest, from what I've heard and seen and read, they don't use them. They look cute in the garden as a decor. They provide ambiance, but I have heard that they really don't ever use those butterfly houses. And I know that they've never used mine. I still put it out there because I think it looks pretty in the yard, but they don't use, they've never used it. And Kathy, I can tell you that we had several in our village, um, Eagle Scout projects where they put them out decorated them nicely mm -hmm. and put and put them out there and what we found is that we have wonderful wildlife we use them but you're exactly correct they're not butterflies yeah but so they what are, do you think is using them yes they are nesting and they're utilized very heavily but the butterflies are not part of that that colonization yes right i wonder i wonder who is using them well you could tell you that there's some are with birds but we've had squirrels they got marmots um we've had a couple of rabbits in the in one i'm with it and it actually in two that were up in the tree and around the area we found out that we had some bats that came into them which was kind of a neat thing to see actually wow okay so somebody's using them just not the butterflies just not the butterflies <laughs> so Okay. Um, 
Aaron asks, is there one direction my second floor balcony should best be facing to plant a pollinator garden? Um, for the most part, butterflies need to be in the sun. They like to stay warm. Uh, so I probably would say the north side wouldn't be the best. But if you're on the east side, you'll have them out there in the morning. And if they're on the west side, you'll have them out there in the late afternoon. And if you're on the south side, you'll probably have them out there all day. Does everybody concur with that? Um, Lisa says, thank you. Great info. Cub Scout Pack 773 will be growing milkweed plants in milk jugs. Then we will transplant to a pollinator garden in a local community garden. Thank you, Lisa. I'd love to know where Cub Scout Pack 773 is. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, why are the big landowners not approached to not include in their contracts with those who actually farm the land forced mowing of all the waterways and ditches? Anybody have an answer for that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I know that through the um, Illinois Department of Transportation and stuff, they have mowing guidelines now uh, that were included in the action plan. So, um, you know, they're allowing for more space for native plants and not mowing as much. So that would be something and, recent. And I could tell you that also at the Department of Agriculture, that they have a big push educationally for family farms uh, to be able to set aside land instead of just not farming it, but setting this aside and giving credit uh, for those that would put in pollinator areas. Yeah, you can even get paid. I think it's the, the, the Conservation Corps, um, but through the federal federal government, there's loans, or not, maybe not loans, but you can get compensated to not grow in, in certain areas, including up against streams and um, riparian zones. So there is good work like that going on. It's slow, but we that's why we need help. We need a louder voice, more voices making a louder voice. Um, how much have the number of monarchs increased? No, not, not at all. <laughs> yeah, not significantly. Unfortunately, uh, Nancy, that this year they're down again. So this is the second lowest they've ever been since we've been recording them. So it was not good news this this spring, the the news that came out. So we really need to um, beef up our efforts. Oh, we have Aaron here from Canada. For any other Canadians here tonight, um, I am a Winnipegger. And uh She's got gave, gave the the link to her take action act locally butterfly way. Thank you for joining us from Canada. Welcome. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Do you have a signage that we can use in our yards? Chicago streets and sanitation thinks that milkweed echinacea and other plants are weeds. That's a good question. That's we're really working on one. Are we working on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we actually have it ready to go. So uh, we can work on getting that uh, more advertised. So how would people, what's the plan on how people would be able to access that? It would be on the Illinois Monarch Project website and they would just have to download it and have it printed. Perfect. Perfect. Any idea when you think that might be? Well, right? as far as I know, it's already approved and everything. So we just... Uh, you know, we just didn't move forward with it because we, you know, you get so many priorities, so we just have to put it out there. Okay. We need the coordinator. To <laughs> yeah. step forward. We need people. <laughs> Help! No. <laughs> um. Yes, Janie. If raising inside or outside, cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness. Don't let them crawl around in their poop. Absolutely. Um. You got to clean those those butterfly cages, net cages out regularly, and get those. Um, and you'll be surprised. They're 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 they eat voraciously as they get big, and it comes out the other end a lot. Um, hi, Greg. If we plan 
plant young milkweed this year, do we have to worry about any impact from the cicadas or on established milkweed? To my understanding, cicadas only go to woody plants. So um, at Sag Moraine, we're recommending that people hold off on planting new shrubs and trees until the fall, until after the big cicada emergence, because um, they're not going to harm established trees. I mean, they might, you know, get you get some brown tip to the branches. But if you have a very young, small tree, it might be a lot of stress on it. So but they don't they don't bother um, forbs or perennials. They only go after woody woody plants, trees and shrubs. Uh, Janie said, thank you for noting about clean, fresh milkweed. Yes, that's that's key if, if we're going to be raising them. We want to raise healthy ones so they don't spread disease to the others. Eve DeRay, what about pollinator boxes or, um, you know, native um, bee condos? Have you had any um, experience with those, Brian? The bee houses? Yeah, they... To find it is us what's better to be honest is to provide some natural trees that are limbs and leave them onto the the ground and they'll they naturally will will get inside and underneath them and create their own hives and just a natural habitat around them uh, allowing them and some freedom not to be viewed negatively and they will you know make up their own areas they really don't need to have a structure is what we found with it. And I, I, I do have some bee houses outside, some native bee houses. And um, I do always get nesting uh, native leaf cutter and mason bees in there. So they really do, they really can't do use them. But with that, again, I would say they got to be kept clean. They can't be, you know, you can't like just keep the same one putting it up year after year. What I recommend is getting one. Uh, check out, and Mary, if you wouldn't mind putting it in um, the link in the chat, um, uh, Osmia B um, sells bee houses that are very good. Just like with the Monarchs, the key is clean, clean, clean. And they make them where you can remove um, and put in fresh, cylinders every year to the ones that are are empty because you don't want like parasites and so on um, building up in those um working um working in a library uh, a good book for families is monarch butterflies by ann hobby very good thanks for the recommendation um mm -hmm. Lisa came back and said, Cub Scout Pack 773 has uh, scouts from the northeast side of Chicago, east side in Hegwish, and northwest Indiana in Whiting. Thank you. And you're planting milkweed in jugs and then going to transplant it. I love you. Do the local forest preserves add native plants? Anybody else want to talk about that? I don't want to. Oh, that's a bribe. I can see they do, um, both in Cook, Will, and DuPage, the collar counties that I can speak of. So I, I'm pretty sure that, that they have a very robust and very uh, aggressive uh, program to be able to create pollinator areas. And that's so I believe that you would find that, yes, they do. Uh, besides that, they in Will County, for example, they grow and cultivate it. You know, we just had that new um, forest preserve tax added, which um, goes towards initiatives such as that. So that just went into effect about a year ago. Great. And and I know that the forest preserves, they're always battling. And that's like another topic for another day. But but they're always battling invasive species that that, you know, we've brought a lot of plants over from other countries that have taken over our natural lands and um you know, so they're always battling, controlling the invasive species uh, so that they don't snuff out the native species that are there. So that's that's a big, uh, you know, just just a big battle that they're that they're all fighting all the time. Yeah, they yeah, are... yeah I know they take a lot of volunteers to, to help out with that stuff, too. Mm -hmm. so if you're interested, look at look up their website and you can go out for a Saturday, 
doesn't have to be regular, but if you're, you know, want to go help out removing those uh, exactly. honeysuckle and all, all the other stuff, um, they'd love to have you. Exactly. Good point. Um, Julie says the ditches are easement and usually mowed by local government. Will the cicadas affect our plants and or eggs, caterpillars and butterflies? We just mentioned that. No, they're going, they're, they're just, they're just trying to lay their eggs in, in the stems of woody plants. That's all they're doing. They're not, they're not going to hurt anybody. It's going to be kind of crazy out there, but they're not going to, um, they're not going to hurt anybody. Uh, thank you. The fines are $600 per occurrence. I don't know what occurrence we're talking about. Does anybody know what occurrence we're talking about? No. Whatever it is, I don't want to do it if it's $600. Uh, Galesburg has a monarch migration festival in Galesburg, Illinois, at Lakeside Center on September 7th. Thank you for letting us know. Um... Okay, Aaron is from the Butterfly Way, is an initiative in the David Suzuki Foundation. It's a science-based nonprofit environmental organization headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia. So good to have our Canadian friends here. Um, any benefits of milkweed cultivars such as silky deep red milkweed, Asclepias, um, Curacavica, Silky Deep Red versus native ones. Well, I'm just going, our first webinar was um, Doug Tallamy. And I am going to um, bow to him when it comes to that question of uh, straight natives versus um, cultivars. And one, you know, he claims that in, in some instances, they will as readily use cultivars as they, I mean, in my mind, the ideal is, you know, like maybe a straight species, then a cultivar of a native plant, then, then down the road after that is an imported plant from another country in regards to usefulness. And then the worst is an invasive species. But, um, but that being said, there are certain characteristics that can affect whether or not they use them readily. And one, one biggie is, according to Doug Tallamy, is the um, color of the foliage. Uh, so if, if you have a green plant that's been cultivated to have red foliage, then that is that is not readily used by our native pollinators. Um, but I will also say that, you know, the growers of native plants, I mean, they know that people are looking for native plants for environmental impact. And they use and they grow them without herbicides and pesticides. If you're buying cultivars, at a garden center, you don't necessarily know that and you don't know what you're bringing into your yard. So that is a problem that I would see for that. Uh, so Debbie feels that bee house tubes are way too short. You end up with many males and they cannot be cleaned and host mites, which then transfer to new bees. They should not be used. Sorry. Okay. I mean, I'm I kind of open on that. Most forest preserves do, but many also have native plant sales. Yeah. And, and I would recommend that everybody, because I know I mentioned our plant sale, but go on the Illinois Native Plant Society website. If you can, Mary, would you mind putting the link of that in the chat? Um, they list all of the native plant sales that that they're made aware of throughout the state. Uh, so check them out to find a native plant sale near you. Tara says, I can't wait to get my Monarch license plates. They are on the way. Do others know they can get them? That's a wonderful question. Would anybody like to talk about the license plates? Yeah, I was surprised. Um, uh, I was surprised at the quality of the stickers. So I just hope it lasts. Do you have it now? Yeah. Yeah, I was afraid to put it on with the snow and the ice because it doesn't seem very thick. It's like more of a thinner sticker. Okay. Well, I would think after a couple of seasons that it might need to be replaced, but we'll see. Um, 
Yes, on the local mowing, some municipalities are now learning that they do not have to mow all the way up to a farm field, but just a few feet past the culvert, leaving roadside area for planting of common milkweed. I mean, that's that's just a huge, I mean, there's just so much habitat that's available out there on roadsides that if we just if we just use that, think of the corridors that that, that, that would um, give us. Couple more. Um, Thank you, uh, Illinois Monarch Project, for a wonderful presentation. We must continue to support the monarchs. And um, sorry for the confusion. Chicago streets and sanitation fines for weeds are 600 per occurrence. That's why I asked about the signs. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, we got We should work on those signs so that people have uh, the power of the, 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 the always like, this isn't this isn't a house let go. This is a house uh, helping helping our monarchs and helping our ecosystem. So yeah, that would be that would be wonderful. Well, that's what we got. Thank you everybody once again for attending, and we hope to see you at our next webinar uh, to learn more about uh, the ins and outs of creating a native pollinator garden. Mm -hmm. So good night, everyone. Take care. Hey everybody, thank you.